Welcome to the RSM Talk Big podcast, helping you invest well, understand money and achieve the best tax outcomes. Your hosts today are Andrew Sykes, Chris Oates and Young Han. Hey guys, and uh, welcome to another episode of the RSM Talk Big podcast, where we talk about topics that help you save, create, and protect wealth. I'm Andrew Sykes, and I'm joined in the studio today by Young Hand. Hi, everyone. And Chris Oates. Hello, everyone. Well, good topic today. We're going to be talking about fraud and, and how interesting is that? I'm sure everyone's been inundated with text messages and uh, emails lately asking them to click on links. And uh, that kind of thing is sort of happening in the corporate world as well. So uh, we're going to be joined today by Roger Darville Stevens, RSM partner. Um, before we get into it, though, I'd just like to remind you to subscribe to our podcast at the landing page, which is rsm.com.au forward slash talk big. And you can also ask us a question there and we can answer those questions for you in uh, later podcasts. So we'll kick it off. Uh, Roger is a former uh, detective and he's now a partner with RSM uh, based in the Melbourne office. So uh, Roger, how's lockdown been for you? We're surviving and fortunately I've got a... uh a home gym in the garage, so I can punch the punching bag and lift the weight, so I'm okay. Yeah, making it through. So tell us a bit about yourself, eh? So you you started out working life as an accountant, or sorry, as a detective, and now you're an accountant. Indeed. So thanks, Andrew. Uh, it's my pleasure to, to answer your questions. And, uh, yes, started out my career uh, after doing an undergraduate degree, uh, went to the police force and started in policing, uh, six years in uniform policing, doing a range of different um, policing functions. And then the last six years as a detective, uh, including at the fraud squad and a counter-terrorist area. Uh, So how different is it investigating fraud as a police officer uh, versus uh, being an accountant? You, You probably wouldn't expect this answer, but it's actually easier not being in the police force because when we're engaged by clients to do a forensic accounting or forensic investigation piece of work, we actually have a lot of information um, at our fingertips through the client with their accounting system, financial system, emails, and getting access to people to interview. And so there's often a lot more information, whereas police have to execute search warrants to get the same sort of information. Yes, I guess your client's wanting to give you the information rather than you having to find it as a detective. Spot on. (laughs) Spot on, Chris. Yeah, so you get it uh, presented in front of you and then you bring those skills um, in interviewing and analysis that you learned as a police officer and then also that deep background in accounting on top of it. Yes, that's correct. And very much um, we have a multidisciplinary team. So not one person has all those skills, but you've got former law enforcement like myself, forensic accountants, uh, forensic technology people, former auditors, et cetera. Yeah, so just say I'm a small business owner and I I suspect that there might be some fraud in my business. So I I ring up my uh, RSM accountant and he gets you to uh, get involved. What what does that look like? How does the process of investigating that run? So we'll firstly ask the client why they feel uh, that that's necessary. What are the suspicions? And often the client will be able to verbalise one, two, three, ten red flags, fraud red flags that he or she is very concerned about. And then what comes from that is us to say, our usual approach would be to use a number of investigative avenues of inquiry to then investigate that and do a factual findings investigation to see if we can support or refute the concerns that they have. So we had that conversation, we create an engagement letter so that the client signs off and agrees to what we're doing and and understands and appreciates that. And then uh, we start uh, our work and investigate. So what does that look like? Is that uh, in in the room with a spotlight on or how do you start? (laughs) (laughs) 
No, we, we, we can use harsh words, but very professionally done and uh, um, all performed consistent with the principles of natural justice and procedural fairness. So uh, there's a number of avenues of inquiry to many most investigations, and that'll be firstly getting a number of the policies, procedures, the financial data, often from the, um, the accounting system, back to source documents to prove transactions or not prove it. Uh, as well as getting access to people to interview and speak with. Also uh, relied on the investigation, getting access to, it could be work supplied mobile phones to take forensic images of, uh, laptop computers, uh, emails uh, through the server at the organisation, uh, and also doing background checks. Uh, there's a range of forensic due diligence background checks we can do including social media, ASIC checks, bankruptcy, and a range of those sort of avenues to get to the source of what's going on. So in, in your experience, does going getting someone like yourself, so a forensic and fraud qualified accountant to uh, undertake this, does this lead to better outcomes for the business? So does the business get better recovery uh, using an accountant rather than going straight to the police? Uh, my view, they do, unless it's a really obvious crime. What I'm saying about that is if someone, an employee steals a computer or equipment from the work site and is caught on camera doing that, the client would report that to the police. But often it's a lot more subtle than that and there are red flags and concerns and it requires a lot more digging to find out what you need to find out. Then we report back to the client, and then it's the client's choice as to what they do with that. They might take disciplinary action if there's proof against an employee or others committing fraud, uh, or they might report it to the police and use our report and use us as a witness to support that, um, uh, providing that to the police for consideration for prosecution, or they might engage a lawyer to actually sue and recover money that's been stolen as a result of the fraud. So all these sort of things can come from that and that decision-making uh, set of options from the report that RSM's Fraud and Forensic Services can do for them. Yeah, so before you get involved, as you mentioned, there's red flags that people have to notice. If that's, how long would it, does it typically happen that could be going on in a business before a business owner even notices that that fraud's prevalent in there, and then I guess what are the what are the costs to the business? I know there's the the global fraud study report that has lots of lots of numbers in it, and mm. but what's the sort of I guess the typical cost? How long until somebody really actually notices it? Sure. So thanks for asking. So the uh, the the general or the average length fraud or corruption uh, issue has been going on before it's been detected. Uh, the global data tells us is about 14 months. Sometimes it can be years, sometimes it can be shorter. And that's before it's being detected when there are red flags that people are starting to observe that then alert the business um, to be able to contact us, for example, and say, we think something's not quite right. What do you think we should do and how should we investigate? Uh, the global data does show and say that on average, 5% of a business's revenue can be lost due to fraud. And so that can be a, a, you know, quite a large impost for an organisation. So you've mentioned red flags a couple of times. What, what are a couple of those red flags? So what should we be looking for? Sure. So certainly living beyond their means uh, is often an indicator and experiencing financial difficulties. Also, people can change in their demeanour and there's no explicable reason why that's happened. Also, addictions uh, can contribute. And so someone might have a gambling addiction or another addiction that has led them to having some financial stress which has led them to steal from the organisation. So we see this very regularly in the investigations we do. 
So if my employee turns up unexpectedly in a Porsche tomorrow, for example, or first-class tickets to uh, London when it opens up again, I st- should start questioning how does that happen? <laughs> so uh, we joke about it, but that is the case that uh, you've got to be a little bit careful with this because someone can get an inheritance, they can cash in some super uh, and, and other reasons or be gifted some money. But it would certainly be a red flag that you'd be concerned with to say it deserves to be explored further to see if there's a legitimate reason for that unexplained wealth. And especially if there's other red flags that um, are associated with that, such as they don't share their particular function in the organisation and there's not a separation, a segregation of duties to make sure that someone has oversight of what they're doing, especially in finance-type functions. Yeah, so, well, I guess that kind of hits hits into the next question where you sort of say where you need oversight, so you need a couple of people looking, I guess that could be whether it's in the finances, money transferring of money, but what do you, what are the most common types of fraud and how does it most commonly impact the business? Yeah, so usually it's uh, procurement fraud, is certainly the most common type of fraud that we investigate. And that's procuring a range of goods and services for the business. And then there may be, for example, um, a close association between an employee who is procuring those goods and services, buying those goods and services and the supplier. And sometimes there's that corruption of a selection process for tenders, for requests for quotation, and there's preferential treatment or kickbacks or cash or other benefits provided for someone to make a decision for the business that not is, is not necessarily in the best interests of the business. So that procurement fraud, that, that could be uh, an employee who has access to a trade account, they go to the hardware store, they, they chuck on an extra uh, dozen bags of cement on the back of the ute or uh, their weekend project. That, that's procurement fraud. Spot on. And, and a good segue to another uh, common type of fraud is business expenses. So if someone has a business credit card or they're buying things for the, for the business and they're buying, uh, they're putting in um, an expense reimbursement application, it's worth looking at those. Um, sometimes there's red flags in those as well. Payroll fraud is another common uh, type of fraud and also asset theft, or even worse still, financial statement fraud uh, is the extreme um, highest dollar amount, but least um, vol- uh, least likely to occur. So um, financial statement fraud, that's when businesses are lying to us in their accounts. Is that correct? Not cooking the books, or it could be even performance um, fraud as well of... of um, Uh, cooking the books of performance to get bonuses within the business or to get and hit certain targets where people get rewards and it's um, defrauded to be able to falsely hit those targets. So we'll be familiar with class actions of, uh, say, share market, uh, shares listed on the ASX and they've dropped and there's class actions. So quite often there would be financial statement fraud behind that, wouldn't there, where they've lied to the investors and therefore the investors have turned around and sued them. It can, but yes. It sounds like segregation of duty is one of the key controls you need to have and with independence of their roles and responsibility and policies. Um, how can anti-fraud controls de- decrease such a risk of fraud and lower cost? Yeah, sure. So there's a number of anti-fraud controls that organisations can take into account, whether they're small to medium-sized organisations or large corporates or government entities, there's a range. So, I mean, let me just give you some examples. So external auditing of financial statements is important. Um, Codes of conduct, policies and procedures, anti-fraud or fraud and corruption control policies and procedures are important. One of the most important key controls is having an effective avenue for reporting suspicions or concerns or red flags. So a hotline or a whistleblower avenue or avenues for reporting these sort of things. 
And of course, going down into the transactional level, the segregation of duties is important so that in like an accounts payable process, there's not one person doing everything throughout the whole process. So they can do uh, a whole range of, of fraud and corruption um, activity without being detected because no one's watching. Yeah, you mentioned about whistleblower. So what is it and how are they now protected? Sure. So uh, whistleblowing is simply the ability for someone to have courage to speak up and report uh, any suspected fraud or corruption. So there's been a huge change in the Corporations Act with whistleblower protection reforms and an obligation on companies to have a whistleblower policy and a whole lot of measures in place. So we're currently assisting a number of clients in providing their independent external whistleblower reporting avenue through phone and internet and email and offices so that uh, reports can come in and we can alert management and uh, they can be investigated. And people can be named, you know, people can provide their details or they can uh, report anonymously. So this is a very key, in fact, it's the most prominent way that fraud and corruption. So it's important now that companies protect whistleblowers. It's it's a responsibility to the company, is it, to ensure that they allow whistleblowers to come forward? Yes, Andrew, it's absolutely key. And there's um, legislative requirements and there's criminal offences and other types of action that can be taken if they're not protected. So many times we'll have a whistleblower as the person who has instigated the investigation with the client. We will speak with the whistleblower and we will ideally gather evidence where we don't have to use the whistleblower. So we get the evidence independently to support what's ever going, whatever is going on. And then uh, the whistleblower can be preserved with confidentiality and, and protected from any reprisals. Okay. So such change and protection, I think it certainly has um, a benefit for the, the fraud control. Do you see any trends happening in the fraud control and investigation? Yes, I think there's there's a lot to do with data. And so we talk about this, and it doesn't have to cost a fortune, but fraud and other data analytics is absolutely key. Organisations have a lot of data that they can drill, they can get reports on, and they can find out there are duplicates, triplicates, um, uh, transactions that shouldn't be. There are transactions that are made out of business hours that shouldn't be. There's matches between the destination bank account of employees for pay and a, and a, uh, a supplier uh, that shouldn't be the case. And so um, fraud and other data analytics is very key, um, as well as all the other technology avenues of, for example, uh, computer forensics on emails to drill through those to find um, incriminating um, evidence uh, to support red flags, if that's the case. So you mentioned this, and there seems to be a lot of work put into fraud controls. Do you have an estimate of, of how much fraud costs companies on average? Yes, yeah, so uh, essentially, well, well, it's 5% of revenue is generally wow. the situation. So uh, that can be a lot. Now, that's a that's, a, that's a, an average across all industry sectors. So a bank or a financial institution is going to be much higher due to the transactional nature of their business. And other businesses will be lower and manufacturing and others will be about in the middle. So it's certainly something to take into account that there's strong business cases for having fraud and corruption control and those sort of controls in place to mitigate these risks and reduce that um, cost to business. Yeah, so it is a cost to business, which means it's a, a cost to all of us. So it's not just the business that suffers, it's the, the ultimate consumer, isn't it, having to pay extra to cover the cost of fraud. So probably important for whistleblowers to come forward and report it and, and reduce this as a cost to business. Absolutely. It's a lot of money, isn't it, when you think 14, 14 months before it can be detected, if it's 5% of your revenue, it's a long time to 
it's a it's a, a big number once you add it in across the across a lot of businesses. It it is indeed, and it, it, you know, I find it hard to believe that someone in the organisation wouldn't have seen the red flags uh, during that fourteen months, that years, or you know several months that it's been occurring. And uh, what we find is when we interview people within organisations, they say, "Look, I actually saw." This wasn't quite right, but I didn't want to believe that it was happening because the person's been with us for a long period of time. They've never done anything wrong, but that's where things can happen, where it changes. People's lives change, and then they have that motive opportunity and rationalisation to commit Because I, I read that um, the Global Flow to Study report, and then I was really surprised because it says the, it causes a loss of about 8300 per month. And the median yes. loss per case is $125,000 and average 1.5 mil. So it's not just a bigger corporate. It's like mom and dad business with, you know, a couple of employees in it. You could be losing about $5,000, $8,000 a month without knowing. Precisely. And for some businesses, that's enough to actually shut up shop. And it's very sad when that happens. So uh, the earlier it's detected, um, the less harm that it's doing to the business. Yeah, it's interesting that thing about uh, causing businesses to shut up shop. Does that does that lead to operational resilience? And yeah, what is that in the in the fraud context? And and how does it apply in managing fraud and and corruption control? Sure. So thanks, Andrew. So um, operational resilience is really about um, predicting, brainstorming what could go wrong, and in fraud and corruption, that's understanding what the sort of schemes are that could occur in any business and then examining your own business as to if you're exposed to those or if there's higher risk business processes. And then being agile, flexible, resilient to uh, keeping an eye on those things, of those controls. A fraud and corruption risk assessment is a really good example of getting to know what you may not know and then understanding where the business is exposed mostly to fraud and corruption, what controls are in place, and if they're operating effectively and minimising the risk of this uh, sort of thing happening to the business. And I think uh, we hear about all these studies and you also said that whenever you do it, it's up to the business owners to decide what next step is. And then we often hear that they don't get executed. Why is the reason for that? They don't get prosecuted, did you say? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So uh, it, it's very difficult because we do an investigation and there can, um, a breach of someone's employment contract is a civil type of um, legal issue. And so the, the, the proof required is on the balance of probability. So it's more likely than not. Whereas... The police are dealing with crimes and their proof level is beyond reasonable doubt. So if a a little doubt occurs, it won't go to court or it may uh, not be successful at court. So sometimes organisations will refer something to the police and they won't won't take it on, although there's, there's a high likelihood that the fraud has occurred. So we do investigations, we provide our clients with those factual findings reports, and then they make that decision based on that. And certainly in many cases where there's support for or evidence to support fraud or corruption, they can then take action um, against the employee or whomever is responsible and may or may not go to the extent of reporting it. Does the employer have to report it to the police or the, the business owner? Is there a requirement for them to report it? Well, I can't give legal advice, but from an <laughs> operational investigative perspective, I can tell you that it differs in different locations around Australia. So uh, in some states, there's no requirement to report fraud to the police. In some states, for example, in New South Wales, in their Crimes Act, there's a section to say that they must notify the police of a crime the police don't have to act or do anything, but at least there's a, an obligation to notify. And so it depends on your location across Australia as to what would um, you, you would be required to do. 
Yeah, I, I would think that um, I'd rather investigate and ask for the money back than um, send them off to the police and uh, all their money disappears or your money in the case of a business that's lost it. So fraud controls governed by uh, Australian standards and I think we've seen a, a new standard released. Um, what's, what's new? I think there's been a lot of anticipation around this. Yeah, so there's a, an Australian standard called AS8001 or 8001 and 2021 it was revised. So only a few months ago there was a revised version of it. Uh, it is a very um, well-recognised standard that was um, 2008 version that's been updated now to 2021. And there's a lot of great information in it. And it isn't law, it's just guidance. So it is better practice for organisations. For example, it goes into detail about a fraud and corruption control system or framework, what an organisation should have in the sense of foundations for fraud and corruption control, prevention, detection and response, and all those activities that fall into that such as fraud and corruption risk assessments, such as fraud data analytics, such as training your employees to know what to keep a lookout for, whistleblower programs, et cetera. So it's also a standard that can be applied to whatever size of an organisational industry group because it's proportionate to the business operations that you're applying it to. So, you know, well, what suits one organisation may not suit another, but this standard, AS8001, is an excellent guide to be able to, to fortunately respond by having your own fraud and corruption control system in place in your own business. And it sounds like it's worthwhile uh, imp implementing at least something. If we're looking at the research as saying that the average business loses 5%, there's going to be ones out there that are losing a lot more, uh, but businesses should at least do something. Does, does that reduce the risk by having a framework? It does. There's a lot of data on the uh, reduced loss and likelihood of fraud and corruption when you have these things in place. And some of them can be perception, not even reality. So, for example, there was one organisation that... Um, uh, we worked with who um, very regularly communicated to their staff about all the controls that are in place and that um, emails and transactional data is being surveilled on a constant basis, uh, which is a good message to spread and it's also a good deterrent for someone who's um, thinking of or was committing some sort of fraud and corruption if they... Uh, know or think that someone's looking over their shoulder more closely. Yeah, I've seen that. I've seen a uh, company that implemented time clocks instead of manual time sheets and their payroll cost decreased by 8% because it stopped honest people stealing time. Excellent. Uh, so that's fantastic, Roger. Thank you for joining us today. If we wanted more information, what's out there and where can we find it? Sure. So uh, RSM uh, website is probably the best way of um, just coming to our RSM Australia website. Um, Broad and Forensic Services is within Risk Advisory Services and there's a whole wealth of information on there, including um, recently we held a national webinar and there's a whole lot of information on there that you can look at and look at the services that we do if you, you need um, our services to assist your business in mitigating the risks of fraud and corruption. And, and just, enough information there just to get started and start looking at your own business because you may not even know that it's happening. Absolutely. And would you say the biggest tip is act early? Act early and probably have an effective whistle and set of avenues for reporting. Uh, that can be external, it can be just internal with a couple of trusted executives that are the uh, recipient of those sort of um, issues because your employees are the eyes and ears of your business to see what's going on. Thanks, Roger. That was great. And thank you, Young. And uh, thank you, Chris. Thanks for joining us. That's our RSM Talk Big podcast for this episode. 
Just a reminder to subscribe at rsm.com.au forward slash talk big or on your favourite podcast service. You can also send us a question on the landing page or email to talkbig at rsm.com.au. Thanks, guys. Thanks for your time. And until next time, I'm Andrew. I'll talk to you later. Talk Big. Create, save and protect with RSM.